royal family. For centuries, projecting an immaculate image of nobility and grace, glitz and glamour, but working tirelessly to keep the royal show on the road, are the servants. You have this incredible intimacy with your royal master or mistress. You do everything for them. And we're going to reveal, in their own words, exactly what goes on behind closed doors. You try and serve strawberries to the Queen in January and it's off to the tower, you're really in trouble. Whether it's preparing Her Majesty's food... She eats her dinner off a tray, looking at the television. She likes it. Pouring drinks. If someone quietly and very respectfully just goes like that, it means no more, I'm fine, thank you. Or packing royal smalls. Boxers do get iron. There's a servant for every task. You did have the clock winder. He would come and check all these clocks because they were all antiques. Some more personal than others. You have to have perfect size four feet as the Queen's royal shoe breaker in. So your job is to walk around in that shoe non-stop and judge when is the moment that they are just right for the Queen. They share the do's. Discretion, loyalty, trust. And don'ts. There's a certain butler whose name will not be mentioned. We reveal the most shocking servant tasks of old. That must be the worst job in history, wiping the royal bottom. And the servant dramas of recent times. If I'd not been like Hussein Bolt racing across the floor, he would have yanked that pan down. This boiling water would have gone all over him. These are the royal servants, in their own words. During the Queen's long reign, the world has undergone drastic changes. Men have walked on the moon. The Cold War has come and gone. And the Internet's revolutionized communications. But throughout it all, it's been business as usual for the royals. The traditions and etiquette have not changed an awful lot over the past hundred years in the royal household. The footmen, the maids, things are really very similar to what they were a century ago. There are more than a thousand staff employed in the many royal castles, palaces and residences. All working for the Queen, her children and grandchildren. Helping them entertain their 50,000 guests every year and catering for their every need. Being a butler for a member of the royal family is one of the most privileged and, without question, life-changing experiences that you could ever have. It could be extremely hard work and very long hours, but it was brilliant work and it showed you a life that you would never have usually seen. Working for the Queen was amazing. Cooking for kings and queens and presidents and garden parties for thousands of people and state banquets. You're doing it every day and it becomes part of a normal routine. But looking back on it now, actually it wasn't normal at all. It was so incredibly special and such a privilege and I really did love every minute of it. All these servants have had an unrivaled close-up view of the royals' private domestic lives. From the beloved Queen Mother. She always had Verve Le Clico champagne, but with a ivory swizzle stick because she didn't like the bubbles. I could never quite see the point of champagne without the bubbles, but... To the gossip-loving Princess of Wales. Princess Diana would very often pop in in the morning after breakfast to just talk to us about what was happening that day. Sometimes Prince Charles would pop into the kitchen with a bunch of asparagus he'd just picked. So it was always a very friendly, happy place to be. Working for the world's most famous family may seem glamorous, but it's a demanding and exhausting job. Keeping a royal palace running is a completely impossible job. It's a huge building. There are so many different nooks and crannies. It's really almost impossible to keep it all clean, all organized at the same time. The monarch has enormous responsibilities. The staff are the sort of, you know, the cogs and the wheels behind it all. And they start earlier and they finish later. The hours start at 6, 6.30 in the morning. And then at the end of the day, you're talking about 11, 11.30, maybe even midnight, and you might get a couple of hours off in the afternoon if you're lucky. And along with the challenging hours, there are the demanding standards, which must be observed at all times. If someone quietly and very respectfully just goes like that, it means no more, I'm fine, thank you. 
I didn't realise. I thought they were wiping something off the glass and it was Princess Margaret. And I carried on pouring the wine through her hand. <gasps> and I was mortified. She went, it's not true what they say. I won't really beat you and send you to the tower. I said, I am sorry. She said, it's perfectly fine. I didn't waste any. The servants' masters weren't always so understanding. A few hundred years ago, there was a palace servant whose actual job it was to take a royal punishment. The whipping boy. I do think in the often grim world of the Tudor court, the worst job of all is that of the whipping boy. A whipping boy was a little boy who accompanied the royal during his tutoring. And when the royal was naughty, the whipping boy got whipped. And that was because the tutor, the governor, could not whip the royal. So they whipped the whipping boy instead. The principle was that the little prince would be so sad that his best friend got whipped that he wouldn't be naughty. That was the vision. But we do have examples when princes themselves were even more naughty just to see how much their whipping boy got whipped, which is really rather mean. Most of us only catch a glimpse of the royals at huge national events. But what makes some sign up for a lifetime of looking after them? I don't know why anybody quite would want to serve somebody else unless you have a natural sense of deference to other people, which I definitely don't have. But if you believe in the monarchy and perhaps you're amazed by the glamour, you're drawn in and attracted by this mystique and the sense of the special, then you might want to be near them. One of my ambitions as a child was to work for the royal family. Or as I said to my father, how do you join the royal family? And he said, you either marry into them or you work for them. And I remember thinking, well, who could I marry? So I took this very seriously. As a little boy, I was taken up to see Trooping of the Colour. I watched anything the royals run on television. I was always bought tapes or books about the royals. Somebody said, well, write off for a job. So I did. I spent the night of the royal wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer on the Mall with my family. And I kept looking at the Mall thinking, I want to work there. I want to be a royal chef. I want to work in the royal kitchens. So when I got home, uh, I applied for a job. The jobs at the royal palaces are advertised on the royal website and have been for several years for the grander roles, for the roles much closer to the, the principles, as they're called. They'll use magazines like The Lady. Founded in the 19th century, The Lady has long been the magazine of choice for Britain's upper classes. In 2015, one job ad in particular caught the eye. Well, there's a few clues in here that could be an ad for the royals. Uh, firstly, it's Norfolk, where they tend to gather in swarms. Housekeeper will be acquired Monday to Friday. So it's not just cleaning, um, but it's maintaining the homeowner's clothing. How many items of clothing do any of us have that need regular maintenance, unless it's an ermine cloak? Doing all the shopping and the deliveries, and the childcare, and the dogs. But the fact as well that it tends to be 24 hours a day, um, and that you live on site does imply that it's someone of incredible wealth, someone who owns a lot of land, someone who really, really thinks their dogs need a servant. The ad was actually for a housekeeper at Anma Hall, William and Kate's country pile near Sandringham. As with all royal staff jobs, certain other requirements were essential. Discretion and loyalty. Discretion, loyalty, trust. Without discretion, without confidentiality, you're not going to get the job and you're not going to keep your job for very long. Coming up, working in the royal kitchens, we reveal the shocking past of Buckingham Palace. It's a wonder, really, that the whole place didn't go down with cholera and typhoid. And uncover how a palace disaster could have scarred Harry for life. If I'd not been like Hussein Bolt racing across the floor, he would have yanked that pan down. This boiling water would have gone all over him. Kitchens are at the heart of the home, and Buckingham Palace is no exception. It's the engine oil for the engine that is the British royal family. 
An army can't fight on an empty stomach, and a monarch can't rule without having some food. Staffed by dozens of chefs, preparing food and drink for the royals throughout the day. It's 7.30 a.m., the kitchen staff's first task of the day, the royal cuppa. She only drinks Earl Grey, no milk, no sugar. The Queen doesn't make her own tea. She has a special coffee room. They make all the teas and coffees. But she would actually pour her own tea when she was eating breakfast on her own. All food created in the royal kitchens is overseen by the Queen. The Queen has a royal menu book that's completed by the chef. And the chef does three days menus. And that gives us enough time to get all the produce in and prepare it. And when the menu book goes up to the Queen, she puts a line through the dishes that she doesn't want. She has a HP pencil, and she'd tick one or add something that she would prefer. The Queen has particular tastes that a chef ignores at his peril. She knows what she likes, nothing too spicy, because she meets that many people. The last thing she wants, I can smell garlic in my breath, or last night's curry. The Queen doesn't eat garlic, and the Queen doesn't serve garlic because the Queen is concerned that garlic clings to the being and you can smell it on the breath. If food is offered out of season, heads will roll. You try and serve strawberries to the Queen in January and it's off to the tower, you're really in trouble. 9 a.m. and it's time for breakfast. Typical breakfast for the Queen would be in her own sitting room. She'd have some hot tea, and then a bowl of cereals from a plastic Tupperware container. It might have been served on a silver tray in, you know, lovely porcelain, but it was still kept in Tupperware containers, just like in anyone else's kitchen back at home. Prince Charles has a very particular breakfast routine as well. Whenever the Prince of Wales came to stay with the Queen, he always arrived with that hamper of his own produce. And in the kitchen, we'd have jars of bottled plums from the Highgrove Garden. The instructions were to put two plums and a little juice into the bowl and send it in to him for breakfast. I'd send in two plums and he would take one. So they'd come back out after breakfast and I'd put the other plum back into the jar and save it. So one morning I thought, okay, he only eats one for breakfast. So I just put one plum in the jar and sent it out into the dining room. And the footman came through and said, his Royal Highness said, can you have two, please? So, oh, so I had to keep sending two in every morning. Today's staff have it relatively easy, though, compared to one royal servant from history, the spit boy. It's always tough work in kitchens, but it's nothing like in Tudor times. In Tudor times, there was the job of the spit boy, and he actually wasn't a boy, he was a man. And his job was to turn a huge, very heavy metal spit on which the meat was roasting over the open fire. If he stops or pauses, the meat will be burned. So he can't eat, he can't take a break, he can't drink. You are absolutely roasting there, and he certainly cannot go to the loo. And all day you're turning the spit round and round and round. You must have felt like you're in some kind of living nightmare. The current queen is more likely to enjoy eating rich pickings at lunchtime, especially at Balmoral. Balmoral affords recreation as well as relaxation. Hunting, shooting and fishing. There's trout in the streams nearby and salmon at the right time of the year. And when they get a good catch, the kitchens spring into action, cooking a lunchtime dish of grilled fillet of salmon with a watercress sauce, one of the Queen's favourites. And royal chef Des Sweeney was the man to do it. Um, the salmon would have been caught in the River Dee behind Balmoral. Dare's worked as the Queen's chef for three years. It's a bit of a go-to safe dish, one that the family enjoy, one that she likes to present to guests. So I've got a fillet off. These are pin bones, they're very, very small. And if you're doing a large amount of salmon for like a stay banquet, it's a very tedious job. A few years ago, when the Queen Mother was alive, unfortunately she got a fish bone stuck in her throat. Traditionally, you uh, swallow bread and bread will take it down. But this day, it didn't work, so they had to get her to the hospital quite quickly, apparently. It wasn't me. The Queen famously hates waste. From the, the tail ends, we'd make fish cakes, we'd go down to staff, or that would go to breakfast dish. Queen eats very sensibly, really. 
meals at a regular time. She doesn't have big meals, doesn't have late meals. So it's been filleted, lightly oiled, and I'm just going to grill it very simply. We just make a few portions, normally one spare, just in case the worst happens, we drop one, or the tray gets spilled, or something like that. The Queen is particular about sauces, so Des has to ensure it's totally lump-free. Generally, the sauce has to be sort of processed for it's very fine. Quite often, it'll be strained. So for plating up, I'm going to use some Norfolk Samphire, just on the bottom, just gives it a little texture. So there you have a grilled fillet of Balmoral salmon, watercress sauce, a light lunch fit for a queen. So with the queen's lunch sorted, it's time to feed the corgis. I always remember kind of hearing, before I worked for the royal family, you know, how important the corgis are to the queen. And for the corgis, it's anything but a dog's dinner. They had their own menu. One day lamb, one day chicken, one day beef, rabbit again, and we'd have to put cabbage in there, we'd have to put rice in there. I mean, the dog boy, we call them the dog boy, the Queen's footman, would actually come down to the kitchen, and we'd have to make sure that all of the meats we cut into very, very fine dice, a brunoir, so that there were no bones in there, because we couldn't have the royal corgis choking. So the corgis of the Queen have really their own footman. The corgis need to have their baskets off the drafty floor. They're given lots of presents. They're very much looked after and brushed and washed. The Queen's corgis can be rather terrifying. Princess Diana called them the moving carpet because there's so many of them and they kind of come in this big, massive group. Some royal corgi footmen have rebelled against looking after the corgis. And in the late 1990s, one particular corgi footman, I'm afraid to say that he laced the corgis drinking water with gin to get the corgis drunk. The footman was immediately demoted for the alcoholic prank. But there's one drink the Queen always stops for at four o'clock. The absolute sacrosanct part of the Queen's day, she loves afternoon tea. Can I just have a little, a little more? And actually, I think it's very instructive that when Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, first met the Queen, it was at afternoon tea at Buckingham Palace. Drinking tea as a social ritual has a long-standing royal connection. Catherine of Braganza, wife of King Charles II, brought tea to England from her native Portugal. She drank it daily, and fashionable upper-class ladies flocked to copy her habit. Nowadays, tea drinking is often accompanied by exotic tidbits, but the Queen prefers something more humble. Jam pennies are something I believe that the Queen has and has enjoyed for years. So when Prince William and Prince Harry were young, that was something that we made for them. Just some lovely white bread, butter, and if possible, homemade raspberry jam. If you had the Queen coming for tea unexpectedly and you wanted to prepare something that you knew she'd enjoy and might even impress her, it's nothing better than these little jam pennies. The Queen does have a sweet tooth, anything with chocolate in. She particularly likes a chocolate biscuit cake, which is made with McVitie's biscuits. But it's not just the Queen. The princes too enjoy a rich chocolate biscuit cake. That happens to be something that my mother used to make for me when I was little. So when I got to cook for the boys, I thought, oh, this is something I should try. And Prince William enjoyed it a lot, obviously, because he chose to have a version of that as his groom's cake at the wedding. Prince William, actually, for his second wedding cake, chose a chocolate biscuit cake to be served alongside the official kind of fruit cake that he had when he got married to Kate, because he remembered this chocolate biscuit cake from having MT with his granny. Seven p.m. It's gin o'clock. When you're the head of state for 16 countries, there's nothing like a stiff drink. A drink was gin and Dubonnet. On a big function, there would always be gin and Dubonnet on most of the trays, just in case. She had to put her hand up and say, can I get a drink, please? When she's off duty, there is reportedly one element of the Queen's private dining that may feel familiar to many of us. She eats her dinner off a tray looking at the television. She likes it. It's homely, it's cosy, it's comfortable. And to polish off dinner... Most days, there'd be a fruit bowl go up. Cream is a big fan of fresh fruit, especially stuff that's grown locally. And eating fruit 
has a particular method. Now, this is how the queen would eat a banana. We don't peel it like a primate. Instead, using the fork, we hold it in place and cut off one end. Then we cut off the other end. And then we turn the knife on its side and go into the skin like so. And then prising it open. And then cut a little bit off and eat like so. But not every royal wants fruit and veg. William and Harry, they loved pizzas, burgers. They loved me to cook them burgers. I remember coming into work one morning and Nanny had asked for roasted chicken and she wanted lots of green vegetables served with it too. Well, I think William or Harry must have looked at the menu and thought, hmm, we don't want that. When I came in in the evening, there was a note on my desk and it said, Darren, please give the boys pizza for dinner tonight. Signed, Jess. I looked at it and thought, why is this in the writing of a five-year-old? And then I realized who'd written it. They actually got the roasted chicken. I was scared of the nanny. The boys' love of food nearly got one of them into serious trouble. I was cooking spaghetti bolognese for them. I had a big pan of water on the stove. And Prince Harry came in over and I just happened to turn and look and he put his hand up on the pan and said, what's in here? And if I'd not been like Usain Bolt racing across the floor, he would have yanked that pan down. This boiling water would have gone all over him. Oh, that was a scary day. The modern royal kitchen is hot on health and safety, but that wasn't always the case. Kate Williams has come to the National Archives to expose a shocking state of affairs when a young Victoria took up residence as queen. Buckingham Palace had been neglected for seven years and almost immediately after the Queen moved in, there started to be complaints about the unholy stink. What I've got here is this amazing report that was made by Dr. Liam Playfair in 1845. As he says here, the smells in the palace are so powerful as to produce nausea and feelings of sickness. He said, the main evil is the kitchen. He says, I'm reminding you that one of the largest sewers in the world runs unfortunately through the precincts of the palace. Actually, it ran under the kitchens and I'm afraid to say it was also leaking. So the sewage was coming through the kitchen floor. If this wasn't bad enough, there were a lot of unsanitary practices in the kitchens, including piling up the rubbish in the dustbins, which were, he says, filled with garbage of a very bad description. And next to them were urinals for the use of the male servants without a flow of water. You can't flush them. And actually, he's really quite rude about the palace. He says, I could not have believed it credible that such an extraordinary instance of scientific ignorance existed in any building in the present day. He cannot believe it. So you've got a potent combination here of rubbish, of unsanitary practices, and of disgusting sewage. They are all eating food in these incredibly unsanitary conditions. It's a wonder, really, that the whole place didn't go down with cholera and typhoid. Coming up, we hear about the servant who drew the shortest straw. That must be the worst job in history, wiping the royal bottom. And the butler who couldn't keep quiet. Honestly, Paul, isn't it about the money? It is not about the money. Absolutely not. The royal family famous for maintaining tradition and discharging its duties with effortless efficiency. But that's only possible thanks to an army of staff working behind the scenes. And no servant works more closely with the royals themselves than the butler. Butler comes from the French word bottle. And in the traditional households, they were in charge of the wine because often the wine cellar was the most valuable part of the house. So the butler was in charge, in essence, of bringing the wine to the guests and the principal and serving them. The butler then became the head of the household. So all the staff below him, you know, the under butler, the footman, the housekeepers, the maids, they're all working under the butler. The butler demands exacting standards of himself and everyone else. As soon as you put the uniform on, you behave and act in a certain way. You become what you perceive to be the character. 
So for me, the character of a butler is the great Anthony Hopkins in Remains of the Day. That's who I initially modelled myself on. I'll hasten to add these days it's Carson from Downton Abbey. But at least fictional butlers don't have to move with the times. Thanks to the internet, we've got all the, the kind of technical stuff to do as well. So there's computers, mobile phones, iPads. We need to understand all that. So butlers have to be a bit of IT butlers in the 21st century. As former butler to Princes William, Harry and Charles, Grant Harold knows their every requirement, both at home and when travelling. So this ideally is the, is the kind of bag you want for an overnight. This is very traditional, but it's perfect for what, what we need it for. Attention to detail is everything, even the smallest. Boxes do get ironed. People say you don't iron boxes, but absolutely. I mean, the butler always makes sure that they're ironed a certain way. There's also a very particular way of folding socks. So what you do is you start off with the sock like this. We'll go to the end, bring it back to the heel, just tuck a little pocket in there. It's almost like a kind of puppet. You're just going to pinch that down, pull this back in itself, just tuck that in nicely, and there you go. So the idea with this is, is when you put it on, obviously you put your foot in there, and then you pull these, the side, pull the side up, and there you go, so that's the sock on. To some, the folding of princely socks and underpants is a privilege, a badge of honour in royal service. But in centuries past, there was a job that promised even more intimacy with the royal personage. The groom of the stool. The job of the groom of the stool was to help the king go to the loo. Whether or not it is use of the royal chamber pot, or use of sometimes what's called as the, the actual stool, which was a sort of square box with a hole in it. The groom of the stool helps the king to the loo, uh, accompanies him and then also assists him to clean the royal bottom. Now we'd think that is the worst job in history. I can't imagine taking Henry VIII to the loo. But at the time, it was everyone's dream job. If you're a junior male courtier, you will fight, you will struggle, your father will pay, you will stab people in the back to get that job because you are with the king intimately talking to him without anyone there. And if you do your job properly, you will get power, lands, and you will usually get a very influential position in the king's government or council because you get closer to the king than anyone else, even his wife. For the royal servants who value loyalty above everything else, going above and beyond the call of duty is natural. One staff member who very publicly went the extra mile was tall Paul Wybrew. Paul Paul is Paul Wybrew, who's famously known as the Queen's Butler. Fantastic chap who has been with the Queen for, for many, many years. And to me, he is very much a traditional butler. It was tall Paul's courage and quick thinking that came to the Queen's rescue one night in 1982, when she came face to face with an intruder. The 1982 break into Buckingham Palace by Michael Fagan was uh, terribly embarrassing for Scotland Yard. Thank goodness he wasn't a terrorist. He ends up getting into the palace, walking around, drinking half a bottle of white wine. And ended up in the bedroom uh, of the Queen. And the Queen tried ringing the police switchboard for help and nobody answered because it was quite early in the morning. And eventually, uh, Paul Wybrew uh, hauled him out of the room before the police got there. For tall Paul, it was all in a night's work. But for the Queen, it was an act that merited reward. The Queen obviously has quite a big property portfolio and she has grace and favour apartments that she can give to her favoured servants, the people closest to her. Paul Wybrew is one of those. He has uh, several properties that the Queen has uh, given to him. And of course, he got a, a bit part in the 007 London 2012 sketch with the Queen. It was a rare moment for a backstage character to emerge into the royal limelight. You did actually see Paul with the Queen at her side. I was so thrilled about that because, you know, that just shows what an important position he has got. Perks like these 
help make up for the famously low royal household salaries. They're also another way of inspiring staff loyalty. There is a bit of a cult around the royal household and being part of it. Uh, the people who are in it are usually very strong royalists and ex-military sometimes. Um, and although they get paid very little, they do get trinkets and gifts quite often from the royals. And they're made to feel like they can be part of the family if they're there for a long time. Prince Charles came to state and he always gave the staff a handwritten card signed by Charles. It showed he cared and he was genuinely grateful to us. It says, Liam, this comes with very many thanks for all your hard work during my stay at Burke Hall in October 1995 from Charles. And he also gave us a little trinket box as a thank you. And sadly, my cats have broken them all over the years. <laughs> I've got one note that I particularly treasure because it was written after Prince Charles had had an accident playing polo and broken his right arm. And he was in the hospital having surgery. Um, but despite everything, he took the time to write me this amazing note with his left hand. I think it's incredibly good writing for a left hand. Um, you excelled yourself this evening for dinner. The first course was a masterpiece. Well done. Signed, Charles. As princes have their butlers, the female royals have their ladies-in-waiting. But perhaps just as important these days are their style advisors, employed to look after every aspect of their appearance and dress. The Duchess of Cambridge has uh, an assistant uh, who works uh, based at Kensington Palace uh, who manages her wardrobe. Um, obviously, being in the public eye like she is, um, she needs a right-hand woman to kind of obviously take, and take charge of her wardrobe for all the engagements and functions she has to go to. The Duchess of Cambridge's very modern fashion servant is Natasha Archer, who started out as her PA before becoming her stylist. And with three royal babies in just five years, Natasha has had her work cut out choosing and styling maternity dresses. Kate's worn this on a few occasions, actually, both pregnancies. Um, she wore this with uh, Princess Charlotte and also with Prince Louis. Hair up, hair down, it's quite versatile. It's Kate's colour, blue. And it's just easy material, it's not going to be clingy. So, yeah, it's a great, great piece for her. Megan's fashion advisor is Canadian stylist Jessica Mulroney, whose first big challenge was to style Megan on a royal tour of Ireland. It was a first tour after they'd been married, so there was huge pressure on Megan to look the part and to look at all the royal restrictions when it comes to clothes. And it doesn't stop at clothes. Accessories and shoes are also key for the young royals. The nude pumps that Kate wears, you know, they're very flattering, they elongate the legs. They're very adaptable, they go with everything. She's just got um, a wardrobe staple when it comes to shoes that, that work, and I think, um, why change what works? Another royal who has a wardrobe staple when it comes to shoes is the queen. But there's a special servant on hand to make sure she never, ever gets a blister. Sometimes jobs in the palace are really very specific. For this one, you have to be a lady and you have to have perfect size for feet. And that is because it's a job as the Queen's royal shoe breaker in her. It can be quite stressful because sometimes the royal shoe only arrives at the last minute and they need to be broken in in time for a royal tour. The shoes could be stiff, the shoes could hurt the Queen, she has to stand all day long. You've got to get them perfect and judge when is the moment that they are just right for the Queen. So your job is to walk around in that shoe non-stop, wear it even late into the night to make sure that it is broken in as it possibly can be for the Queen. Along with her favourite block heels and designer hat, the Queen is never without her trusted handbag. But it's not just an accessory. It's an invaluable way of communicating with her staff. Well, it turns out that the Queen's handbag is extremely important, not just uh, because of what's in it, uh, no cash, we're told, but also what it signifies. And apparently when she's ready to go or ready to leave or wants to give her ladies-in-waiting a five-minute warning, she'll put the handbag on a table. All hostesses have to have code to convey messages when they are entertaining. The Queen is no exception. For instance, you need to be rescued by somebody who's too enthusiastic and who won't be moved on by the hints you give them. The Queen has had more than 70 years' experience of looking the part in public. 
and she rarely gets it wrong. Her trademark outfits are carefully designed and planned by her right-hand woman and devoted servant, Angela Kelly. It's a fantastic success story of, of working your way up for Angela Kelly. She started as a royal servant, as a dresser to the Queen, and clearly uh, they got on very well. Angela Kelly actually is one of the Queen's most trusted aides in terms of getting her wardrobe right and almost, almost acting like a bit of like a gatekeeper, um, being the person to whom, you know, if you wanted to get to the Queen, you would go to Angela Kelly to try to have a word with her on your behalf, almost. Like the vast majority of royal servants, the Queen's fashion guru observes a golden rule. I know it's a fact that Angela Kelly never steps over the invisible line. Despite the affection between her and the Queen, Angela does not push the boundary to the extent that it would end up edging towards disrespect. The royal family uh, offer friendliness, but they don't offer friendship, and that's a very crucial distinction. But not all servants have followed the rule, one in particular. There's a certain butler whose name will not be mentioned, whose delusions of grandeur became so preposterous that although for a while the public bought the act, even they have finally seen through it. Paul Burrell's rise is remarkable, starting as a junior footman to the Queen, then moving to Kensington Palace to work for Charles and Diana, and now as this figure, if you believe him, as, as the rock, the only person who can uh, defend the legacy of Diana. Burrell became increasingly close to Diana after her bitter divorce from Prince Charles. Following her death in 1997, he started to negotiate deals for books and TV programs about his time with the princess. But that soon came to an abrupt halt. In 2002, Paul Burrell was on trial for stealing uh, Diana's property. He said he had just kept it for safekeeping, and he had told the Queen that that's what he was doing. And when that trial collapsed, he sang like a canary about all the things he'd seen and done. He helped smuggle friends into the palace and boyfriends sometimes. Her boyfriend has Nat Khan and uh, reporters as well. I used to go in in the boot of, boot of someone's car into the Kensington Palace car park. In a best-selling memoir, the butler turned whistleblower went public on Diana's numerous lovers, royal temper tantrums and murder conspiracies. I'm sitting on a letter which says that the princess thought that she was going to die in a car accident. What do you think I should do with that? There aren't very many royal staff of that seniority and of that level of access who have said as much as Paul Burrow has. Honestly, Paul, isn't it about the money? It is not about the money. Absolutely not. I personally feel that these staff members that have left and then dished the dirt, if you like, I think really are not very nice people because they were in positions of trust. I just hope that, that you know, the royal family going forward can still have the same trust they've had with staff in the past. But who knows? Coming up, a right royal mix-up with the servants. I said, the gardener wants to speak to you. And he went back upstairs and I walked with him. And he said, oh, good morning, Royal Highness. And I thought, it's not the gardener. And away from home, Kate and William are faced with a rather phallic diplomatic dilemma. Try a bit, think of England, carry on. They didn't have to put the whole thing in their mouth, which would have been pretty gross. In palaces and castles up and down the country, servants have attended to our royal family for centuries. Butlers, chefs, footmen, all working tirelessly to keep the royal show on the road. Then there are the maids. Tracy Waterman trains these crucial staff members for royalty all over the world. The difference between a housekeeper in a five-star hotel and in a royal palace would be attention to detail. Um, somebody working in the palace would be trained to look at the unusual. And Tracy has ways of ensuring only the best candidates get through. One of the tests I like to do to see if a candidate has potential eye for detail is to place a dead fly, either in a fireplace or on the carpet. 
Once the dead fly is placed, I would then um, bring the candidate into the room and lead them into the room um, quite slowly, um, just giving them a chance to glance the room, have a little look at what we've got inside the room and bringing them to the fireplace and maybe just highlighting we've got a beautiful fireplace and at this point I would expect them to see the dead fly and hopefully, hopefully pick it up. It's a great test. Um, probably out of 10 people, half the candidates will notice the fly. One out of 10 will actually bend down and pick it up. That's the special housekeeper. For servants, the royal customer is always right. That means viewing things through the boss's eyes. It's very important to see it from the principal's perspective. They've presumably hired the best trained staff um, and they expect you to see the room like they see the room. You could lie on the bed just looking up to the ceiling, a completely different view of the room that you would have if you were going in just to clean. Again, in the bathroom, getting into the bath, perfect example, you're lying down, you can see under the sink, you can see behind the loo. So really, everything you do, you need to be taking from the principal's point of view. You need to be his or her eyes. If you looked up at the sink and there was water marks, soap marks, you really wouldn't be too happy to see that, and certainly the principal would be quite cross. <laughs> there are 78 bathrooms requiring daily cleaning by the maids at Buckingham Palace alone. But some of the royal servants' jobs are rather more specialised than others. People might assume that a butler winds the clocks or looks after the artwork, which we, we don't, you know, don't touch. I mean, I certainly wouldn't touch the artwork. I'd be terrified of, of can you imagine suddenly messing a piece of artwork up because I'm trying to clean it. You did have what we called the clock winder. He would come and check all these clocks because they were all antiques. Not just a clock, it's all the clocks. So it's a full-time, it's a full-time job. It is your job to make sure that every clock dongs at the same time. Because it would be nothing more annoying to have a thousand clocks striking 12 at a different time. They have to strike 12 in unison. And your biggest job is when the clocks change and we move to British summer time, because you have to change every single clock by an hour. People might think, well, that's an easy job, winding up the royal clocks. What fun going round around the palace at these lovely old clocks. But actually, it's a really tough job and it's one that requires a lot of precision and a lot of skill. Punctuality is extremely important to the Queen. And when she travels with her staff to any of her residences, every one of her 1,000 clocks needs to be set to the correct time. When the Royal Family move from home to home, it's not a case of you just throw a couple of things in the back of the car and off you go. I mean, it's a huge operation, especially when we're talking about the Queen. You're moving the court from one location to the next. One of the things I became really good at as a Royal Chef was packing and unpacking boxes. We would be in London during the week and then travel to Highgrove for the weekend or go to Scotland for a week, go to Sandringham for a week. In terms of luggage, there would be usually two massive transit vans full up and what was on the Queen's flight, what we took up to set up everything. It was quite hectic, especially if you drove up during the night from London to Scotland. That was quite tiring because then you'd get there and you'd have to work, start work straight away. It took lots and lots of planning. You had to make sure that all the food was ordered to go into Balmoral Castle where we were going for you know, four, six, eight weeks. And although the kitchen staff and equipment are the same, when they got to Balmoral, things were always a little different. Prince Philip loves to cook three, four, five nights a week. They would actually go off and barbecue in the hills. That's when the royal family liked to sort of relax and let their hair down. Once the trappings and routine of royalty are quietly laid aside, the few precious unwinding weeks at Balmoral are a time too for a gathering of strength for the year ahead. The job of being royal is strenuous. Prince Philip was very interested in food um, and he'd come down and help choose the ingredients for the barbecue and the Queen used to put the salad together. Food is still chopped up in the kitchen, so all they have to do is mix it up. For us it was good, it was more like a night off. It's still served on nice china, it's still served on nice silver, but they serve it themselves. And then afterwards the Queen would actually rinse and scrape the dishes. I mean. Imagine that. However, some felt it wasn't fitting for the Queen to be getting her hands dirty. 
Once when Mrs. Thatcher was up at Balmoral, she noticed that the Queen was doing the washing up without gloves. So Mrs. Thatcher went and bought her some rubber gloves and sent them to her, <laughs> which was rather sweet. <laughs> That's the sort of present that she would love. It wasn't just gifts that arrived unexpectedly. I was in the kitchen, I was on my own in there. And this old man walked in. And he was wearing tatty old clothes and he'd got this cardigan on with the arms all worn out. And he said, where's the chef? And I said, I'll just get him for you, sir. And I went down and found the head chef. And I said, the gardener wants to speak to you. And he went back upstairs and I walked with him. And he said, oh, good morning, Royal Highness. And I thought, it's not the gardener, it's Prince Philip. <sighs> the chefs also play a key part in royal travel. Between 1954 and 1997, the Royal Yacht Britannia took the royals all over the world. On board, the Queen hosted politicians and dignitaries. And for the chefs, logistics were at the top of the menu. You're in a confined space, the kitchen's not very big, you don't know where anything is. There was a lot of people, a lot of dignitaries, a lot of VIPs, a lot of security. A lot of them would come through the galley. So you'd be cooking away, and next thing there's more people walking through, and it's like, they're like, is he working in the kitchen or is he a VIP? I don't know what he is. For a royal chef, the show must go on, come hell or high water. We were sailing into a storm, and I put chocolate souffle on the menu, and that was a big mistake. It gotten around to my course, I put the souffles into the oven, and I went outside, and the storms were getting worse. I came back inside, looked at the souffles, and they were rocking around in the bowl. I just went outside threw up over the side of Britannia. Oh. Sometimes it was so bad, the Queen would helicopter off and fly ahead. And it was like, OK, it's going to be rough. And of course, Prince Philip loved it. Yay, let's go, let's go, because he used to be a sailor. On tour, it's the job of the staff to make sure digestive disasters for the royals are to be avoided at all costs. When a royal goes on tour, huge consideration is given to what they eat. Just, <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit individual tastes taken into consideration. They might say, well, Prince William, he likes curries, or, you know, the, the Queen, for instance, famously, doesn't eat shellfish. Not because she doesn't like it, but because obviously shellfish can give you an upset stomach, and if you're doing an important diplomatic tour, you don't want to miss a day because you're sick. But when our younger royals have been faced with unfamiliar delicacies, sometimes it can prove to be a diplomatic challenge, as Emily Andrews witnessed. When I was on tour with William and Kate in 2016 in Canada, we were at this lovely kind of presentation of seasonal Canadian produce, and suddenly we see this clam called a geoduck. It's a delicacy, and you eat it. And so Kate and William were kind of going around the stalls, and we were all, all as pressed, kind of waiting for them to present it, this geoduck clam, and what would they do? And bless them, they both tried it. It's very phallic. They didn't have to put the whole thing in their mouth, which would have been pretty gross. So the etiquette there would just be to pick up the food item, have a little nibble, make some polite remark, and then place it down. Try a bit, think of England, carry on. Coming up, an English king whose servants cooked up a favourite dish that defies belief. It looks like what might happen to us post a nuclear Armageddon. You're not going to make me try and eat this, are you? They definitely are. It's so gross. And the younger, more modern royals have their own ideas when it comes to what they'd like their chefs to prepare. Harry and William don't want to live like Grandma. Kate in the papers was dubbed Two Kitchens Kate. The attention to detail is key in the royal household. Whether the royal chefs in the kitchen are preparing for a state banquet or nibbles for the queen when she has her afternoon tea. Finger sandwiches, so like the cucumber, smoked salmon, cream cheese. Cut into four, minus the crust. And then you turn them on the edge and you cut the edge off so they look like 
little 50p pieces, and that was how they present it. But there's one thing above all the staff know is crucial. Produce must be locally sourced and sustainable. They were long into seasonal food, long before high street, supermarkets, restaurants, because um, they understood the produce and where it came from. For Prince Charles, this interest in how food was grown became a passion. Prince Charles is notorious in country house circles, for when he comes to stay, he often brings his own food. Not everybody thinks it's a good thing to do, but people put up with it. You know, it's one of his eccentricities. For royals of the past, healthy eating wasn't a priority. Henry VIII lived a life of gluttony and excess and championed grotesque and meaty concoctions for his servants to prepare. The cockentries was one of his favorites. Historian Kate Williams is going to meet Andrew Clark, a chef who still uses an open fire and has been preparing this calorific creation. Oh my goodness. I've read so much about the cock and trees and I've never actually seen one. And there it is. Half pig and half chicken. It looks like the most terrifying mutant thing I can possibly imagine. Kind of what might happen to us post a nuclear Armageddon. You're not going to make me try and eat this, are you? You definitely are. It's so gross. The cock and trees was created by taking half a pig and half a chicken and stitching them together. There's no nice way of stitching this, really. It's all quite Frankenstein. It's pretty freaky, huh? The cock and trees was roasted on an open fire and served up by the king to his waiting VIPs. If you're Henry VIII's chef, you're just giving him a big signifier of his power here. You're really showing off his brilliance. Henry basically spends the equivalent of five million pounds on a massive meat feast. And this is the centerpiece. It's about grandeur, it's about excess, and really showing off. How can we think of the craziest thing to do? I know, let's stuff a pig with a chicken. You know, how fun is that? Would you like to try some? I'm kind of terrified. And also, I'm quite excited because it does smell good. Well, let's give it a go. Let's, let's see give it a go. Like. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Mm, that is beautiful. If I was at Hampton Court eating this rather marvellous meat, I think I'd be pretty impressed. Well, I think we should drink to the cock and trees. Cheers. Cheers. The new modern royals are far less demanding. And even though they've had an unconventional life in the limelight, they're much more used to rolling up their sleeves without the help of staff and getting their hands dirty. We're living together as brothers and it's fantastic, it really is. He does most of the cooking, I just laze around watching TV. If you think about William when he was at university, he did have that regular university experience. You know, he lived with other students and that he did the things that other students do. He certainly wasn't up in St Andrews with a chef who was preparing his meals. You know, that just wasn't happening. And same way with Harry when he was in the military. He didn't go with his own chef. It was very much a case that he fitted in and did what everyone else did. To bring it up to modern day, aren't they? You're too kind. Thank you so much. It's the new kids on the block. Harry and William don't want to live like Grandma. <laughs> the modern royals seem to be much more interested in food healthy eating, and I think that's exciting. When William and Kate had apartment 1A at Kensington Palace renovated, they famously had two kitchens put in, one kitchen for them to use personally, and also a professional kitchen for hosting events at Kensington Palace. Kate in the papers was dubbed Two Kitchens Kate. I've had conversations with her about how much she loves to cook, and she certainly likes to cook for the kiddies. When faced with a baking challenge, Kate can definitely rise to the occasion. Yeah! William, however, could do with a little practice. Of course, when we think about the royals, and particularly the Queen, you know, they have loads of staff to do everything for them. But actually, Kate cooks a lot of their meals herself. And I think she likes to do that, because like most of us, that's the heart of her family life.
But even though the younger royals want to shake things up and do things their way, it's almost impossible without the servants. Kate will not be queen in a tiara going shopping around Waitrose. That's not going to happen. She wouldn't have time in any case. She's going to be too busy. But there are some members of the royal family who have a reputation for needing their staff more than others. The title of most pampered royal is uh, hotly contested. Some say it's Prince Charles. He lives a pretty grand lifestyle. That's why he's uh, received criticism. Uh, more than 130 staff costing five and a half million pounds in the last accounts. Yes, Prince Charles is very reliant on staff. In fact, Prince Charles leads a far more extravagant lifestyle than the Queen. Uh, because he takes after his grandmother, who encouraged him from he was a baby to love luxury. Probably good form today, isn't he? Even Charles's sons have reminded him of how little he does for himself. There's a great scene where Harry lets it slip that his father's a bit pampered. Prince Harry was cleaning his polo boots because they were dirty, and Prince Charles had a go at him and, and demanded to know why he hadn't cleaned them a bit earlier. I always clean them. I played yesterday, I didn't have a chance. <laughs> there was someone else to do it for you. <laughs> for Harry, he's his own man. He'd clean his own polo boots. For Charles, absolutely not. He is not getting his hands muddy cleaning those polo boots. Of course he's pampered. He's the Prince of Wales. He's also the first billionaire prince in history, so he can afford to do pretty much whatever the hell he likes. And I would, if I could. But there was another family member who liked being pampered even more than Charles. The Queen's sister, Margaret. Princess Margaret had a lot of servants who did all kinds of jobs for her. And because she was such an inveterate smoker, there was at times one who did follow her with an ashtray. I would have thought Princess Margaret in her prime would have had a number of people queuing up in order to hold her ashtray for her at parties. A lot of young men probably would have wanted the job. And also, of course, it may well be that the carpet was particularly expensive. And uh, if you wanted it not to be ruined, of course you would follow Princess Margaret around with an ashtray trying to catch it. Coming up, what happens to staff when they leave the palace gates? The great rewards. You work at the palace to get the most amazing experience, and then when you leave, the sky's the limit. You could be on 100 grand the next year. And the crushing lows. He was pretty much turfed out straight away. And it's that moment, I think, that Billy Talon had of realizing that he was just staff. The royal family relies on its servants to function. But of all the servants, one is particularly trusted. The staff member who looks after the royals from the moment they're born. Being a nanny to a royal must be a really difficult job because you're trying to give them something of a normal childhood in just the most fabulous circumstances in palaces with you know, untold numbers of staff around you. You've got to have the right nanny to make that royal grow up like a decent human being as opposed to a royal human being, which would be different. William and Kate have gone very old school for their uh, nanny, for their children. It's almost Mary Poppins-ish. Maria Barallo is Spanish, she's in her 40s, and she is a Norland nanny. And uh, that's one of the most prestigious nanny training colleges, and you can tell because she wears a brown bowler hat. Norland College has been training nannies since 1892. But even this institution has had to move with the times. One of the aspects of the course that our students follow is uh, cyber and personal security training. So we have former military intelligence officers who come in and just raise their awareness really of some really basic rules to follow, such as how to not give away their geolocation, how to be a little bit more aware about what's going on around them and so on. The nannies are even trained in martial arts to safeguard themselves and their precious charges and the protection measures stretch to the roads. We also include skid pan training. Um, lots of people think that's so that they can escape the paparazzi, but really it's about trying to make sure that students are equipped to cope with driving in more challenging, difficult circumstances. Perhaps if there's ice on the road or something. So it's really just trying to cover every potential eventuality as much as we're able to. But however good the training is, 
It can't prepare a nanny for everything. Especially one finding herself in the middle of Prince Charles and Diana's failing marriage. Diana painted Tiggy Leg Burke, the nanny, very much in Charles's camp. She didn't like how familiar she was, apparently, with William and Harry, but there was a lot of he says, she says stuff then. And you're expected to be the neutral zone, to see everything, hear everything, and never say anything. So he, no matter what Princess Diana said to Tiggy, she had to just sort of grin and bear it. Despite offers to tell her story, the former nanny always kept her silence. In 2018, she was rewarded with an invitation to Harry and Meghan's wedding. Rising to the challenges of being a royal nanny is one thing, but feeding the royal children with your own milk is quite another. And a hundred years ago, that was the job of the royal wet nurse. The royal wet nurse is there to breastfeed the child, so the royal mother does not have to breastfeed. It was thought as infra dig for a lady to breastfeed, very, very bad. It's something that low class women do. So you hire a lower class woman and you hire them basically because they have large bosoms. That's what you're looking for. Healthy, large bosoms, lots of children. Children who've lived, that's very important. But there was also another job requirement that was not to be ignored. You've got to make sure she doesn't have red hair because it was thought that a red-haired woman was very passionate. And so if she was breastfeeding your child, she could make them angry and tempestuous just because she was red-haired. So you're looking for someone who is blonde or brunette. And the job of the royal wet nurse really can be quite a, a lucrative and well-paid job, but of course it means you are always there on tap for the royal prince or princess. Queen Victoria was thought to be the last royal to have a wet nurse. But not all royals favoured using female servants. The Queen Mother lived a very Edwardian existence at uh, Clarence House, and uh, she famously had quite a few uh, camp staff. And one of the anecdotes is that she said to, to two who were arguing, when you two old queens have stopped bickering, this old queen would like a drink. She was known for adoring her staff, and, and they adored her. The Queen Mother may have had another reason for employing gay men in the palace. I was told by William that the Queen Mother liked it because when the Queen and Princess Margaret were young, to have gay men around was safe. To have straight men around might not have been. But what of the gay servants themselves? Why have so many been attracted to working for the royal family? There's probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first I think inarguably would be that when homosexuality was criminalised, it was one of the safest places to be. Ridiculous as it seems now, in living memory, it was a criminal offence and there were certain trades and certain professions where there was safety in numbers and service, whether it was at a stately home or a royal palace, was one of those trades. During her many decades of public service, the Queen Mother had countless attendants but she grew to rely on one above all others. William Tallon, also known as Backstairs Billy, one of the most famous royal servants of recent times. William Tallon was fascinated by the royal family and worked his way up through the system and became Queen Mother's trusted page and did, I think, a, a very good job. After years of devoted service, the Queen Mother rewarded Billy with a grace and favour apartment near Clarence House, which he shared with his partner, Reg Wilcock. But when the Queen Mum died, at the grand old age of 101, he took the news very badly. I mean, I remember him saying that the worst things that ever happened to him was when his parents died and when the Queen Mother died. And after that, he didn't really have a role. So suddenly he was just bereft of this institution he'd been part of for a long time. Not only had his beloved employer died, but he also had to leave his palace apartment. And it's that moment, I think, that Billy Talon had of realising that he was just staff, and that he found it quite upsetting. Billy was lost. He turned to drink, and his health declined. In 2007, five years after the Queen Mother's death, he passed away. But in a final gesture of goodwill, he was granted a funeral at the Queen's Chapel in St. James's Palace. Not all 
all servant stories end like Billy's. In fact, for many, a royal staff job has been the springboard for much greater things. You definitely don't apply to the palace to make a lot of money. The ladies maid typically will be paid 18,000 a year, whereas our entry level ladies maid positions start at 45K. So you've got to bear in mind that you might take a not well paid job, but then, wow, the opportunities you can go into. And when they leave, they take that training and that training is worth money. It's worth money to billionaires. It's worth money to movie stars. You could work for oligarchs or industrialists or prime ministers anywhere in the world because you can say, I know how the Queen has her Earl Grey served and at what time. And, you know, and a shake in Oman is going to say, come here and have £100,000 a year in a Bentley. You can work for me. But if you've had enough of being a servant, there are other ways to cash in on your palace CV. When I started at Buckingham Palace, my first job uh, was actually working on the vegetable section because no one can mess up vegetables. After working for 15 years as a chef to several royals, Darren McGrady's now an American TV celebrity. He'll even personally cook you a royal feast or give after dinner speeches for a mere 10,000 pounds a time. The servants might be able to flourish without the royals, but could the royals ever cope without them? The staff are absolutely key to the success and the look and the maintenance of the royal family. You cannot do that without people. What we love about the royal family is the tradition and the pomp and the splendor. But without the staff, we wouldn't have any of that. That's something our servants know all too well, as they look back on a life of royal service with pleasure and pride. It was just a wonderful job. There was always something different happening, and it was a privilege to do it, and it was an honor to do it. Such a privilege, such an honor, but over and above everything, it was just so very special to cook for such wonderful people. I wanted to experience what it was like to look after them and to work for them, and that's what I eventually made happen. That, that dream came true.